Thank you very much, Jocelyn. Um, okay, so um, at some sense, I am going to try and answer the question of how do we actually know what's going on inside the sun. And I also want to just um, emphasize some of the issues. Pe often people think that science is definite, there's an answer, everybody knows that answer, if you're an expert, and if you're learning, you just have to get up to speed. And actually, the reality when you're at, good analogy for here, the coal face, uh, when you're at the coal face, it's not certain at all. You have to have faith in what you're doing and back it up with some good science. And then years later, it looks obvious, but it wasn't at the time. So I shall show you some of the things that, that um, uh, sort of, some, some early data and some late data, and there's a clear difference between them. We're talking about um, the pulse. So what I'm talking about, and I'll, I'll explain to you, is stars that pulsate or oscillate. And the sun is but one among many. But as Inika has said, it's kind of uh, nearby and useful to us. And um, I start with a very famous um, astronomer, Sir Arthur Eddington. There was a wonderful television program a couple of years ago um, where uh, we were actually discussing Einstein and so on and how you communicated through World War I when you were on opposite sides but you wanted to work on the same science. Um, it's a classic picture. It's a person taken with the tools of their trade, which is very true. Um, one might argue that the tool of his trade wasn't observation but was actually theory, as I shall show in a minute. The other thing of note is that uh, he's got no glasses on. And if you see less posed photographs, he always wears glasses. So like my mother, he was vain. He took his glasses off before he had his picture taken. Anyway, he posed the question in 1926 that says that at first sight, it would seem that the deep interior of the sun and stars is less accessible to scientific investigation than any other region of the universe. So our telescopes probe further and further into the depths of space. So you talk about the beginnings of cosmology here. But how can we ever obtain certain knowledge of what's hidden beneath substantial barriers? What appliance can pierce that? So what he wanted to know is what drives stars, the things that Inika was telling us about the nuclear reactions. Nuclear physics wasn't very well founded at this point. Eddington had an answer, which he was a theorist. Theory is the answer. And theory is kind of useful, very useful. But as Jocelyn was saying, there was a new field um, which evolved. Uh, Birmingham was one of the real drivers for it and it enabled us to get under the skin. And the subject is helioseismology. If I've got any good classical scholars here, one bit one is Latin, one bit's Greek. Distresses people terribly. Um, <laughs> and what we're talking about is using resonant sound waves in the solar interior. Now, we've seen that there's convection on the surface, and there was uh, a comment about a kettle. So if I turn a kettle on and go and do another job in the kitchen, how do I know that when that kettle gets close to boiling? Part of the fact it switches off. <laughs> and the answer is it gets noisy, right? As you bring the water up to a boil, the convection increases and convection produces sound. And those sound waves are produced close to the surface but propagate through the whole volume of the sun. And I have a demonstration for you in a minute, but totally, totally unexpectedly, those sound waves don't just disappear. They actually drive the sun into resonance. Now, that bit was not predicted. When the data were first produced, people basically said, garbage. <laughs> and it took several good pieces of scientific evidence to convince the community that actually this was a real effect. 
But we have a, um, a demonstration here. This is um, actually a fire bell, but it's a very nice fire bell. It's on a bearing, but I won't rotate it for the moment. And I'm going to bang it. Now, banging it carries no... Th th this here and me hitting it doesn't know what sound is going to come out of here. What comes out is a nice, clean note. So I've taken something that's basically a, a kick, a pulse, and it's the natural frequencies of this bell that actually tell, tells it. It's the shape, it's the material in it. It's actually a very carefully chosen bell because it's nice and uniform in thickness. Any old bell won't do this for you. Um, but it, essentially, the, the noise it produces carries information about the bell. So what I have here is a picture of the sun, a cartoon, three dimensions, the different colored blobs, my sun's yellow, different colored blobs are essentially traveling in different directions, towards you or away from you. And this is one of hundreds of thousands of possible oscillations that the sun could have. And you can see that this one, um, doesn't go through the whole volume of the sun. So if I look over here, I run out of color as it happens in this particular one in the center. I'm running out of color around the poles. I could choose you other oscillations where the location of the waves is very different. And there are some that go right into the center. There are some that are very much located around the edges. And the fact that that's true is um, very powerful. So I have here some theoretical tracks of sound. So you can think about this as light, if you like. You can think about it as a light ray. And you know the concept of a mirage, that if you're watching, looking at an image that's over a hot desert, then the image, the, uh, the image gets inverted. The, the rays get diverted. And that same thing can happen to sound. So it goes into the sun. As Inik has told us, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter. That alters the speed of the sound and can turn the sound back so that it comes back to the surface. So I have two tracks there. One is skipping around the edge, coming back to the surface lots and lots and lots of times. The other one is coming back much less often, but is going in deeper. That is phenomenally powerful because it's going to allow us to image. It's going to allow us to answer the question, how do I know what's underneath? Just like you can use x-rays to produce CT scans of your interior without having to cut it open first, so um, you can produce sound maps of the interior of the sun. And those sound maps, the speed of sound depends on what's there, what's the material, and what the temperature is. Those are two very important parameters. OK, so um, I want to collect this data. And I'm basically not a theorist. I'm an observer and an analyzer of data. And Birmingham was one of the prime movers in this. And we have a picture here taken of one of our domes in Birmingham um, and a nice brick building. And in the background, uh, if any of you have been to Birmingham, we have a clock tower, which was actually public time. It was meant to be visible over a very wide area, and it is. It's quite remarkable. Several miles away, you see this tower sticking up, and it represented public time. Um, the scale here, the clock tower's terribly tall, and we're standing rather close to our dome, right? So the dome would look small inside here, it's about 12 foot diameter, and it's feet because it's built for the American market. It's built for the am amateur market in America. Um, and we've had a building put there to, hang, to sort of put the dome on top of. Um, the physics department in Birmingham, the pointing physics department, is a Victorian listed building. So those of you who have ha had any dealings with listed buildings know that life is not trivial. Um, we're on top of that. We had to use mortar that was compatible with what the brickwork of our building was, and we were not allowed to line the building, our building up north-south, 
because the actual physics department isn't lined up north-south. It's about three degrees off. Yeah. Wow. Now, inside, we could do what we wanted. But So this is a dome under autonomous control. OK, so that's a sort of starting point. But then you think, OK, what do I want to observe? What's it, what things do I want to have to happen? Well, romantically, the sun, sunset, sunrise, wonderful times, particularly when you talk about solstice. If you're, you're an observer, it's awful when the sun goes away. Right? Not what you want. So what you do is you go around the world. So you set yourself up in a whole series of different places, um, but sadly, Birmingham is not one of our key points, because that's a slightly more typical picture. <laughs> Great place, Birmingham. I'll advocate anyone to go, but you don't go for the weather. And actually, even on a beautiful day, like the first one I showed you, the atmosphere does not compete with the atmosphere above the high Andes. Right? You really do see the difference. Um, and actually, if you're um, an, ast an astronomer and you look at the sun, you don't look directly at it clearly, but you hand up and block the sun, and you see how close you can get to it. And most of the places, far too much scattering, the sky is milky. And, right. So we set up to uh, build a ground-based network so that we could have a continuous view. Um, an alternative is to go from space. Uh, it's extremely good. It's very expensive. And you can't easily repair what you put up there. There are examples clearly in low Earth orbit, but repairs are tricky and very expensive, whereas we run are actually on a shoestring from the ground. So there's our locations around the world. Uh, we measure what's called Doppler velocity, so that uh, you know, as a siren goes past you, the pitch changes. Well, as the surface of the sun moves with a period of about uh, five minutes, it's a slow walk for five minutes and a slow walk back, uh, that changes the color, the wavelength of light, and we measure that as, as a velocity. And we have a website, and that's the link for anyone who'd like to see it. And we're in mid-latitudes, because that's a good compromise between length of day and decent weather. Um, the four southern hemisphere ones are all these domes. The northern hemisphere ones, for various reasons, actually are slightly different structures. Um, it's another picture of it, uh, which makes you see the latitudes rather more clearly, spread out in longitude. Um, we're called bison. Um, you can see that our first data was 75, and that was episodic. We, the, the equipment, b before I was in Birmingham, but the equipment was taken to certain places, and set up, and for a couple of months, observations were made and proved the point. And one of the things that really proved the point was being in Hawaii, which you can't see, but it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and um, Tenerife, Isanya, and actually showed that the data were the same, so it couldn't possibly be atmosphere or anything terrible like that. Um, but at the time when we were starting to put our network in place, which was the mid-'80s, um, we were told, A, we had to have an acronym. OK, crucial. So what do you choose? At the same time, there was an American network being designed. And the statement we were told was, you, you're first, you can go ahead and observe for a bit. But once the American network comes on, well, we won't need yours. So what we thought was we... Um, bison can be Birmingham Solar Oscillations Network. It's a valid acronym. But the bison were hunted to extinction on the American plains. <laughs> so we thought, OK, well, if we are dead in a few... You know. But in, a, in the event, we still survive. Um, we got our network by 91 and we're still running. And actually, we collaborate with rather than compete with the American network because we measure slightly different things. OK, so... Back to the oscillations, and I want to try and tell you a bit now about some of the um, getting some of the physics into this. So a string. If you start at the top and work down, you ping the string and it produces a note. If you then hold it in the middle and twing, ping the other bits, then you get a slightly higher note. And as you put more and more fixed points or nodes in, you're going to get a higher and a higher and a higher note. And each of these produces a characteristic 
node, characteristic frequency. Um, the um, fixed points are known as nodes. So that gives you a pure note. And I've made a comment there that says, in real instruments, you don't get a pure note. So if I have the orchestra and tell them to play A, is it the one that everyone tunes to? You don't, if you just think about listening to it, it's a cacophony. You don't actually hear just one note. And how can you tell the difference between the double bass and the flute? Anyone suggest? You can tell, can't you? And what you tell is because you don't get a pure note, you get a harmonic structure. And the harmonic structure is totally different for the different instruments. And the sun is no different. The sun produces... Um, is, when you look at the sound waves, and there are sound waves in the interior, but I'm not hearing them because there's a vacuum. All right? It would actually just be terribly noisy because of all the convection. Um, I'm looking at light, which is what's conveying the information to me. So I'm about to show you some real data, but I need just a couple of levels. Now, close your minds to this if, it's, you know, if you don't like a bit of mathematics, if you like. But I'm going to use some numbers, and some letters, rather, and L and M. L tells you about stuff going round the equator of the sun, and M is telling you about rotation of the sun. Try not going, L is, L is going, um, thank you, latitudinally, and M is telling you about rotation and longitude. And the effect of where you held the string fixed um, is the number of nodes, is N. So here's some real data. Horizontal axis in frequencies, so you might think middle C is 256 hertz. Uh, here I'm in uh, milli, sorry, here I'm in microhertz, thousandths of a hertz. This corresponds, to, as I said, to about five minutes. So that's what this is about, something that's varying with five minutes. The strength of the oscillations are in the vertical axis. And I've labeled the modes by their structure. So the L equals naught is a simple breathing mode, in and out, in and out. L equals one is a dipole. And I can't do the others. Anyone fancies trying it for me, I'll happily learn. But we can model it, we can show you pictures. But, um, so if you look at this, you can see that um, if I start on the left-hand side, I get L equals 1, a few others, another L equals 1, a few others, L equals 1. And the 2s and the 3s and the noughts all repeat. So I'm seeing here several orders, the effects of the fact there being many nodes between... Uh, the, the surface of the sun and the center, so I'm seeing repeats of the pattern. I'm not actually seeing the fundamental, and that's one of our science goals. From the difference between the difference in frequency between any two of those spikes with the same L value, I can tell you the mean density of the sun. Or of another star, if this happened to be a measurement of another star. So from that simple thing, I tell you the mean density. You'll see that the modes are paired, and in particular, uh, the naught 2 separation. That actually happens to tell you about the conditions in the very center. So to answer the question, how do I know it's going on? Well, all I can really measure is the temperature and the mass composition, but the temperature is the thing that's changing magnificently. I can tell you what the conditions are, and I do that by testing myself against a model. So the theory is crucial here. And when we were first producing um, our network data and so on in the early 90s, there was a huge problem. Um, you may have noticed on the pictures of the, of the atomic processes going on, nuclear processes going on, there are little particles called neutrinos produced. And they're very elusive, they don't interact very much, and they're an important part of particle physics. And they're supposed, or they were supposed, to be more precise, to have zero mass. Solar, the, the, um, solar physics produces these particles from the nuclear reactions, and particle physics has processes for measuring these neutrinos. And the rate that was measured was roughly one-third the predictions. So you have 
you decide, first of all, do you believe the measurements? And they were, they were superb tour de force measurements. Right, so you decide they're right. You can either decide that you've got your particle physics wrong, or you can decide you've got your solar physics wrong. And the thinking at the time was, we've got the solar physics wrong. Well, the particle physics community is very big and very powerful, and I could tell you some politics, but... <laughs> and, and the reasoning was that said, well, the temperature in the center of the sun is very high. You only have theory to try and tell you what it is. And the rate at which you produce neutrinos depends very, very, very strongly on the temperature. So we guess that you've got it slightly wrong. However, we came along with our data, which was a measurement of the conditions and the temperature in the center of the sun. And that said, solar physics is right. <coughs> anything you do to mess with the temperature here produces something that's so far from anything we measure is not correct. And the consequence was that the particle physicists had to go back and think about what they were doing. And then for ah, if I give the neutrinos a tiny bit of mass, then that mass interacts with the big mass in the sun and actually swaps <coughs> neutrino states. There are three, and it'll take one particular one that's coming out strongly from the reactions and was the one that was being measured and turns it into one of three different states. And there's your factor of three. And it was uh, a very... It was a very important step, and now, actually, it's well agreed that neutrinos have a bit of mass, and people measure it and measure these oscillations in neutrinos, and it's fine. The next thing I want to try and give you some idea about is precision. So you've seen pictures of the sun, another cartoon, um, and we've imagined we've cut it away, and the center has the nuclear reactions, and then there's a radiative zone and a convection zone. And we can, try and, we can use the fact that different oscillations go into different depths and have different angular structures to map the interior. And one of the things you can do is compare the speed of sound you get from that mapping process with what your theory said. Now, your first cut might be to, measure, to sit the two on top of each other, but if you did that, they would look perfect. So what you do, <coughs> what you do is plot the difference. So if I plot the difference, here, a horizontal axis is the radial distance from the center, so the center of the sun is um, over on the left, and the surface is on the right, and the vertical axis is the fractional difference. So we're talking about 0.1% is what 0.001 is. And you can see that the differences between what our best model at the time said and what the observations said is a lot less than 0.1%. So your first cut is pretty good. Your second cut is, that's massively more than my uncertainties. So we clearly haven't got it quite right, which is good. OK, so you, the models can change if the other um, observations change. And one of the things that's important here, I said the mass, how much of each element there actually is inside the sun. And Hydrogen and helium are the dominants, but um, what are known as metals in astronomy, which is a terrible phrase, but everything else is there in small amounts, but very significant. And carbon and oxygen are kind of important for us. Um, Jocelyn has been known to give a talk with a little bit of stardust, um, but that's another topic. Um, some new analysis techniques came along for how you studied the surface, and they changed what they thought the percentages was, were of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and neon. And what that does to the data is the blue curve. So it doesn't look any happier at all. That's interesting. What, uh, the agreement has got a bit better over the years, but still not perfect. It's probably telling you you've got two compensating errors. If you have only got uh, one set of data, then you make things work. It's like we thought we understood what planetary systems were when we only had our planetary system. And what modern satellites are finding is totally different. So that's actually a challenge. We haven't solved this problem. This is an unsolved problem. 
Um, we can also measure the internal rotation. Now, you have a spectrum there again, microhertz, as you saw before, compressed up a bit. Two bits picked up, one at high frequency, one at low frequency. And first thing you might say is that the high frequency one is a bit of a mess and actually becomes we can't really get out the numbers we want, which are frequencies from that. The low frequency is really nice. If you looked at where it is down the bottom, you might be tempted to think that there's nothing there. And that's why we blow it up, so that it looks a bit better. And what you see is that instead of these single frequencies that you saw before, actually there's more than one. And I want to show you why. OK, so there's my bell. OK? Now, those of you who are good at tuning guitars will be well tuned in to listening, but what I want you to do is I'm going to strike it again and I'm going to rotate this. And I want you to think about what the difference is. OK, you hear it going up and down? That's a beat because one wave that's traveling with the rotation is having a slightly different pitch from the wave that's traveling against the rotation. You can put it on good mathematical trends, on um, rotating frames of reference and things, but simply, that's what you see. So, the fact that that mode there has several components depends on um, its structure, its surface structure, the mode, um, but it's a way of directly measuring the rotation rate, the average rotation rate of the sun. This was revolution when we first produced this. We needed lots of data before we got the precision that the noise looks anything good enough to actually show this. You can see they're very small. But there was a huge dispute about what the center rate was. It matters if you want to know about the center of the sun. It also matters for Einstein's theories because one of the early tests before the really lovely one of actually detecting gravitational um, waves right now was to do with how Mercury moves. And that depended on you knowing the, that the rotation rate of the sun was at least below a certain value. And you could put a ruler on that and tell you what the answer is. We do it more sophisticatedly, but you could put a ruler on that and that just the problem walks away. So you can build a map. Um, the picture on the left is a color-coded map. Um, actually, on the side, the false color. I actually think we're not careful enough in the modern world to distinguish between simulation and reality. I actually think there's a big philosophical argument to be had that how often do you not know whether you're seeing something real or seeing an artist's impression? So these are real data. The colors are figments of people's imagination. And blue is slowly rotating. Red is faster rotating. So as was indicated, the um, equator is going around faster than the poles. We cannot tell you what it's doing right at the poles because we're observing from the ecliptic plane, from the plane in which we go around the sun, and so we can't see the pole of the sun very well. So we don't get very good data for it. We want a mission that does seismology that goes over the pole, and then I'll give you the polar map. Different topic. And then the graph actually is just cuts through that. Now, there are several things of interest. You can see that there are different rotation rates there, and I wouldn't worry about the numbers, but they correspond to about 26 days rotation that takes the sun about 26 days to rotate. What's it fascinating with the red lines is the way they all come together. So we believe that the interior, and I'll show you another picture in a minute, is going round at a, as a solid body. But this differential rotation of this gaseous material is in the outer regions. And the zone where they all come together is of fundamental importance. Because that, and this is a properly labeled thing, I can't remember if it's all Latin or all Greek, but it proper, um, is a region where the shear is changing very rapidly, and that's believed to be the seat of the magnetic field. So um, if you take in the data that I produce, you can get all the way to the center, and we think that, as I say, it's solid body. 
You start, when, before you make a measurement, you have some idea of what's going on. And if you think about having um, some liquid and you spin it, what you expect is that the, that the sort of rotation rate you measure will depend on how far you are from the axis of the spin. That's what's meant by rotation on cylinders. That was the theoretical expectation. As a very young researcher, I sort of said, why? And they said, it's obvious. I thought, OK, I'll stay quiet. And it's not. It's not rotating because they had forgotten what's called the Coriolis force, the force that tilts the um, trade winds and stops them um, just blowing, um, um, it makes them blow northeast and southwest rather than what you might expect on northwest and southeast, whichever one it is. Um, so that was a case where you had theory, and it was crucial that you had theory because that tested something, but the observations told you something different. And it's key, as I say, this tacker line is key for the generation of the magnetic field. Now, what I want to do next is just talk briefly about the solar activity cycle, because that's something that we're very interested in. So you have a picture of the sun. Um, you can see the color is fading slightly darker as you go to the edges. That's real. That's actually telling you about the temperature variation with height. Um, they've been measured for a long time. They've been measured for a very long time if you go to the Far East. But um, in Europe, um, John Fabricius, or Fabricius, 1609, observed spots and saw they moved and interpreted this as an indication of the sun rotating. And I love it. It was a private publication. He wrote somebody a letter in 1611. And then Shiner, who was um, a Jesuit, and Galileo observed, and you know the trouble that um, Galileo got into. Shiner was told by his superior to get some new glasses. Spots, yeah. Um, William Herschel, who was the son of... No, that's, that's, the, that's the father. Um, he showed that high grain prices were correlated, and the grain data came from Adam Smith. And that the high grain prices correlated with a spot-free sun. That was interesting. Um, Schwab found the solar cycle, and the Royal Astronomical Society gave him a gold medal for doing this, so he noted that there were real periodicities in this. And Carrington, now I don't know if Carrington has any prominence around here, but in the bits of... Anyone know Carrington? bit of Lancashire I grew up in, they're beer brewers. Carrington is beer. Um, but one of the young men of the family, before he had to settle down and run the family business, was very keen on astronomy and set up the notion of Carrington rotations, which I think... Will you talk about a little bit? Carrington effect? Carrington himself will be important. And as far as I know, he had to go back to the business when I guess his father died and he had to go and earn his living. Um, so, the number of sunspots varies with time. Actually, it's a, not an 11-year fundamental cycle, it's 22, because the magnetic field actually reverses every 11 years. And w I'm actually hopeful that we will see some effect of that in our data, but that's future. Right, so they were, conditions were very quiet, and are very quiet, actually. Um, in the last solar minimum, there were 50 days without a spot. That's unprecedented. Uh, as you've seen, the strong magnetic fields sit above regions where the spots are, and the reason why the spots are dark is just that the convection is inhibited. And I can't remember which Herschel it was, and I suspect it might be John, but there was a discussion about the spots are dark, right? And you might think they're really cold. And there was a discussion that this might have been caves, and maybe if we wanted to go and colonize, then we'd go into the caves. People at that time had no way of measuring the temperature of the surface of the sun. It was, it was conjecture. So we know that's not a good idea. They're only relatively speaking cold, so that's not a solution to overpopulation. Um, magnetic fields, very strong, and there's the classic picture of the Earth sitting there giving you a scale. So um, you can plot the number as a function of time, and the maximum has two humps in it, and that's... I'm not going to talk about it, but that's actually quite interesting. Um, and that max maximum we've just gone through is very low. And the sun now 
is much like it was 100 years ago or so when the sun went through a very quiet period. What we don't know is whether it's going through a quiet period or whether it's going into a zilch period. Um, I have a picture, and normally I would do like um, Inika and show you a current picture, uh, but I chose this one because it's pretty current. But there was a transit of Mercury. That's Mercury. Moving across the surface of the sun. So it's quite pretty. OK, so if you plot the number and go back in time, there's a period called the Maunder Minimum where um, sunspots disappeared. And we know it wasn't just the observations because... Um, Although in Europe there were difficulties about making the measurements, there weren't in other parts of the world, and it's very clear that this is right. And that happens to be well correlated with very cold winters in northern Europe, frost. Um, there are other correlations you can show with, as I say, with grain prices and so on. Now, I have to say this is a correlation and not necessarily a truth. I have a picture which I've lost, but it's an article from Nature, which is a very erudite magazine, and um, it was showing essentially a correlation that you can't believe, but what it plotted was a number of live births as a function of time, which goes up and down, and also showed the number of nesting storks, <laughs> which followed the same pattern. <laughs> and it was a serious article in Nature. So, correlations are correlations, and they sometimes are indicative, but right. So, that's all talking about the surface. What's happening underneath? Well, we're measuring the frequencies, the oscillations, and what we find is that the frequencies increase as the activity goes up on the sun. We think it's actually the near surface, and it's about one second in 6,000 of the travel time through the sun. So, if the sun stopped generating nuclear energy, we wouldn't know for 100,000 years. If it stopped generating, we, we who are observing the oscillations would know in a few hours. Sound comes out very promptly. And there's good but not perfect correlation with um, various activity indices. And some evidence you saw the very localized strong fields and the distributed weak field that they both probably matter. Now, what I want to show you is the data on which the pronouncements were made. So this is the early publication. And um, the left-hand side is just the frequencies as a function of date. And don't worry about the, it's an astronomical unit that's chosen. And then the right-hand one is the correlation between the shift and the sunspot number. And I guess if I showed you that lot, you'd say, ooh, possibly, possibly. But this was the data that we had that we published, and the correlations are good, and we believe it. That's the modern data. And there, you wouldn't, you wouldn't argue for a minute that the two are going up and down. You make the original scientific advance on stuff that's marginal. Because if it isn't, everybody's done it before. And some of it turns out to be wrong, but we try not to be wrong. Um, and most of it turns out to be right. So convection is what drives these, as we said at the beginning, and it drives the oscillations not only in the sun, but in low-mass stars like the sun, and I want to just do a tiny bit on that. There's a mission called Kepler, which you might have heard about. Uh, it's been finding planets. It was put up by NASA to search for planets around other stars, exoplanets, and a team of European seismologists, of which we're part, um, went to NASA and said, we can take your signal and we can measure the oscillations of the stars. You should care about this because if you find a planet and I can find the oscillations, I'll tell you its mean density and I'll tell you, essentially from that, I can tell you what it's, and where the oscillations occur, I can tell you what size it is. And that is a and its mean density, as I say, and its fundamental importance, not just to say, well, the relative size of the planet and the star is such and such, it allows you to really be quantitative. And the Americans said, thank you. You may have access in the proprietary period. We won't charge you anything. <laughs> be our guests. So we were. We had to promise in Bud not to find planets, 
but it was okay. We'd... And the goal for NASA is essentially the Goldilocks zone, a planet in the right zone that's not too hot, not too cold, just perfect. And that's a very recent picture from NASA, 10th of May 2016, so the green band is the habitable zone, and they're beginning to find planets in habitable zones. Now, there are issues about some of the stars around which they find, which we'll come on to, and that perhaps conditions are not quite ideal, but we're beginning to find them. The next steps will be to search for chemical elements, evidence of what we think will go with life. And that's a whole different subject and not one that I'm really in. So it's a very exciting time to try and find out. There's lots I haven't told you, um, but it's very exciting. There is a view as to what really is happening inside the sun. <laughs> OK. Uh, it's the Sun Tribune. What else would you read? Uh, it's a bit warm. Uh, but you turn the lever, you bring the sun up and you bring it down. So that's it. Thank you. Again, thank you very much indeed, Yvonne. And we have time for some questions. So we'll start over here. Can you explain in more precise details how you measure the sound waves, what mechanisms you use? Yep. And secondly, and it's related, um, if you would accept in the principles of acoustics um, that there are different f methods of generating sound waves, idiophones, chordophones, aerophones. Okay, you're ahead of me at this point, but go so on. So an idiophone is basically what the bell you just struck is an idiophone. Yeah. The sound is being vibrated by a, a solid body. An aerophone is like a clarinet. It's, it's a, a, a volume of air passing through. A chordophone is like a violin. Okay, um, I, I get the picture. Um, and so, is there a sense that you have within both the measurements and also in the data that you're collecting um, that the reason I'm asking this question is that might the sounds, might the acoustic properties tell you something about the actual physical makeup of the, of the sun itself? Okay, so the first answer is I'll give you a brief answer. And you're welcome to ask me offline for the real detail if you want it. <laughs> In the spectrum of the sun is evidence for the elements that are present in the outer region. One of them is an element, potassium. And potassium absorbs the light and gives you, if you look in the spectrum, a sort of wavelength spectrum now, you see that there's a dark band. And we have a process that has a tiny little cell, about 15 centimeter cube, in which is potassium that we heat to a vapor. And we shine the sunlight through this. And we then look at, essentially, where that, the line is in our laboratory, which is our instrument, with the line that's coming from the sun. So we're comparing potassium atoms on the sun, potassium atoms on the Earth. We start with the fundamental principle that we say it's the same physics in both lots of potassium, and therefore if the wavelength at which, where this line occurs, is shifted, that's due to movement. And we measure um, a shift in terms of the speed of light, so what we're measuring routinely is parts in um, 10 to the 9 and a billion. So actually within the physics department in Birmingham, we are the high resolution spectroscopy group because this is phenomenally high precision. That's how we do it. It's not, it's not like anybody else does it. But it has the advantage of being beautifully stable physics um, and therefore gives us measurements that are good year on year on year. The answer to the second question is, we think it's due to explosive the, the, the granules that you saw, and we think it is just like the bell being hit. That um, it, it's like if you were to put that into a sandstorm rather than just pinging it once. It would constantly get banged and it would produce its resonant frequency. And you can model this, you can use theory to model it, and what you observe appears to um, justify that. So we think that that 
is the way that fits with what we actually observe and some of the second order effects that you observe. It looks like it is just pulses, stimuli. Are there other questions, other topics? Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, from the photographs, they seem to have been taken by flyby satellites um, in the previous lecture as well as your own. Uh, I'm trying to imagine what actually happens on board the satellite. I don't know how close they get to the sun. If you had an acoustic detector, you're flying through a perfect vacuum, you'd hear nothing at all. No. The sun is silent. It's yeah. done with light. It's done Absolutely with light. done with light. But what it's measuring is sound inside. Sound to answer your question about how close they go, yeah. uh, there is a mission which is um, supposed to be launched. You remember when Solar Orbit is going up? 2018, something like that, yeah. that is going. It won't do much of my sort of stuff, but it will fly by and it'll get uh, not. 0.25 solar radii. 0.25 astronomical, astronomical units. units, sorry. And Mercury sits at about 0.4, so it'll go inside the orbit of Mercury. And it'll fly by, and we'll be very worried about that it makes it through the temperatures. But it's completely silent, no matter how close you are to it. Because it's a vacuum, yeah. So although I'm measuring sound, I'm using light to do it. 